Hello and welcome to the Sustainability Leaders Series. I'm Oriel Morrison. It's well known by now the global transition from fossil fuels to renewables is critical to meeting the world's emissions reduction targets set out in the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. But these fuels, including coal, oil and natural gas, still remain our dominant sources of power, supplying around 80% of the world's energy needs. Every year, the World Energy Council releases its Trilemma Index, so named because of the energy trilemma which countries have to manage. Energy security, energy equity, and the environmental sustainability of energy systems. In its most recent edition, Sweden took the top spot, closely followed by Switzerland and Denmark. In fact, the top 10 spots were dominated by OECD countries, particularly in Europe. To explore this further, we're joined now by Dr. Angela Wilkinson, Secretary General of the World Energy Council. Angela, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Oriel. Now, Angela, what essentially is the purpose of the Trilemma Index? Do you hope to bring attention to those not doing enough? Well, we, we introduced the, the World Energy Trilemma Index framework um, nearly 20 years ago, and we use it to help uh, countries track, assess, and design their policies for moving forward. And the index has a global comparative ranking of 120 countries. So countries can look and see how they compare with others. But more importantly, it also provides them with their national year-on-year -year improvement measures. And we can also look at who are the top performing countries, the most improved, and who are the least improved countries, and what can we learn about the policies that they are making and changing. So it's designed to be a tool to support governments and their stakeholders in thinking about how they manage the trilemma through transition. Mm. So when you look at the fact that this index actually tracks national policy performance over time and measures progress against other nations, who stands out as a top performer over time? Well, over the last 20 years, of course, the European countries have tended to come top in the World Energy Trilemma Index in terms of the comparative rankings. And that's because they've had a longer standing approach to incorporating environmental and sustainability policies alongside affordability, equity and security policies. But of course, what we've seen in the last six months is a European energy crisis, which is cascading across the world. So we know that we have to rethink the security aspects of the World Energy Trilemma Index and Transition Management. Secure, this security crisis is very different to the oil shock of the 1970s, which was very much about constraints of supply. This is actually a demand-driven energy crisis shock because it's countries deciding to uh, decouple themselves from supplies in other parts of the world that have contributed to these high prices and cost of living crisis. So energy security is no longer about supply side diversification, we now have to think about demand disruption and demand destruction in energy security. Now, talking about cost, you, you have often said that when it comes to the energy landscape overall, what we see today is crowded, uh, you've called it competitive and costly, and we need to see more sustainable energy. Are we moving fast enough when it comes to this transition? Well, the World Energy Pulse, uh, again, survey this, this time around, shows that most countries think this current um, global energy shock will accelerate energy transitions in all regions. But I think the important bit to remember is that there are multiple energy transition pathways. There's no one size fits all. Each of these pathways will have a greater mix of resources and technologies and will also use um, other measures such as carbon capture and storage and nature-based solutions in order to achieve their net zero goals. And the other bit that we have to bear in mind, as you, when you opened, Oriel, you talked about 20% of the global energy system is currently electrified. 
and only 15% of that 20% is renewable electrification. So as we take renewables to scale, we are finding new security issues around materials, metals and water in terms of taking renewable energy resources to scale. Now, when you look at the region as a whole, uh, China was a notable addition to the top 10 list of overall improvers. Do you see this continuing? Well, I think China, you know, manufacturing hub of the world, um, huge population, is doing everything it's ca it can to manage its domestic energy security, affordability and environmental sustainability and think about its contributions as an international leader in this area. So we all rely on China for solar um, photovoltaic capacity at the moment, but it is the manufacturing hub. You, you look at the amount of um, supply chains that go through China for the solar uh, power revolution. The, we, the, we saw the IEA yesterday saying we have to diversify that solar supply chain more. So I think China has stepped up to do its, it, what it can domestically and also is stepping up to do what it can internationally. And that raises risks as well as opportunities for other regions. Mm. Now, uh, Angela, there's clearly no one size fits all approach. There's huge diversity in energy systems. How is success measured? I think success is measured in that we're all moving in the same direction, albeit there might be variation of speeds and there will be multi -path multiple pathways Success can't be measured through a single metric of carbon alone. If we just measure the metric of carbon, what we see then is that policy swings from climate change to COVID crisis to security crisis to cost of living crisis. We really do have to take a trilemma approach to integrated policies, to working across sectors. The energy transition can't be delivered by the energy industry working alone. It has to be delivered by the economy working together with society and investment playing its part. Now, that's not a quick and easy and simple thing to do. The coordination challenges are massive, but we're confident. Mm. Uh, really interesting findings. Uh, Dr. Angela Wilkinson, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to talk to you today, Ariel. Much still needs to be done on a global level to reach the UN's goals for sustainability. To talk more about the future of energy, I'm joined by Ray Wills, Managing Director of Future Smart Strategies. Ray, welcome. Now, when it comes to energy specifically, how much faster do we need to move on a global level? Oh, look, there's no doubt that um, what we're seeing now is not fast enough. Uh, there's also no doubt that we're capable of moving much faster. Uh, I also have a high expectation that we will move faster, and particularly with the Climate Change Bill in Australia, uh, with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the USA, uh, and now today with India uh, having announced uh, its own bills coming through, we're going to see a lot more action from the global community. Well, that's good news on, on many levels. Uh, Ray, what would you say our future energy mix looks like over the next five to ten years? How rapidly will we see that change? So I'm fairly uh, aggressive in my forecast. I believe we'll get to 80 per cent global electricity production from renewables uh, by 2030. Um, some people call, it, call me nuts, uh, but we are on that trajectory. Uh, we're actually going to be pretty close to it. Last decade was a practice match for renewables. Uh, we, we learned how to do things. Uh, this decade will simply be an execution of that practice. And so therefore, we're going to see a rapid expansion. So for example, China this year is planning to build 108 gigawatts of solar alone. That's five times as much capacity as they've actually got planned for coal. That's just enormous. And uh, China has now built more energy in a year from solar than Germany has built in it in its whole entire career. Mm, yeah, those are impressive numbers, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're, when you look at renewable energy as a whole, there are many different forms. In, in your opinion, are we ever going to get to, or when will we, I suppose, come to a time when we're 100 per cent dependent on green energy? I think we'll get to 96 or 97 per cent fairly quickly after 2030 with, with my target of 80%. I actually believe if we do a moonshot, we can get to 100% by 2030. 
but nobody's announced a moonshot yet. So therefore, we've got the bills that we have, and those bills will um, should allow us to easily get to a 2030 target of more than 80%. Uh, the last couple of percent will always be hard, uh, and the last couple of percent will rely on battery technology uh, becoming as cheap as solar technology. Solar now, we acknowledge, is the cheapest way to create electrons to generate electricity in the world. Uh, what we need is an equally cheap way to store it, uh, something that's cheaper than established hydro, something that's cheaper uh, than warm concrete uh, from the paver, if we get heat from the paver. Uh, what we need is really cheap electrical storage. It's going to take us another two to three years to get to a point where commercial storage is absolutely the cheapest way to have backup power. So when you look at the overall mix that you're talking about, including, of course, the storage of energy, where does hydrogen fit into the mix? Look, I think hydrogen has a role in replacing the black hydrogen we currently use. The world uses uh, 171 million tonnes of hydrogen a year. That's worth $71 billion. That's a pretty uh, impressive little industry. Uh, virtually all of that hydrogen currently comes from carbon sourced uh, energy or carbon source materials. So we need to convert all of that across to hydrogen. But I don't see hydrogen necessarily playing a big role in uh, delivering thermal storage. There may be um, some exceptions in some countries who will focus on that, and Japan, I think, will be one of them. But I think globally and universally, uh, the world is more likely to discover that electric storage delivers what they need. Mm. When we look at the, the world on a geographic basis, Ray, where does Asia sit in terms of innovation and, and, and where on the curve are we right now and how fast are we likely to get to the top of that curve? We're really accelerating quickly now uh, and that's being reflected in the construction rates, not just from China, but also globally. Astra even Australia now has 25 gigawatts of solar, more than 25 gigawatts of solar established on rooftops and in solar farms. Uh, and we've now got companies in Australia, energy generation companies in Australia, talking about uh, one gigawatt batteries. And we're not the only country doing that. Lots of other countries are doing that too. But we're seeing those projects being announced now with an expectation that they'll be built in the next two to three years. Mm. Uh, Ray, a, a great topic to be discussing. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Aaron. And that wraps it up for this episode in the Sustainability Leaders series. I'm Oriel Morrison. Now, for more in this special 12-part series, head to apacnetwork.com.